welcome. Welcome to Hug Nation. Oh, I have probably too much to talk about today. For some reason, uh, I keep getting thoughts and reminded of experiences that I had over 20 years ago in Turkey. I took off some time from school and went traveling through Europe and ended up spending two months in Turkey. And it's an experience that changed me for a number of reasons, but it's also an experience that is impossible to have now. This was in 91, I believe. And at that time, there was no internet. So I actually traveled for four months in another part of the world with no contact. I actually called home once in the two month mark. So I went two months, called home, checked in, found out that everybody I know is still alive, and then went on in my adventures. And looking back, I realized what a treasure that experience is. What a rare gift that was. That is something that is impossible now. You would have to work exceptionally hard to have that experience. Just 10 years later, in the late 90s, I traveled for a month through Turkey. I mean, excuse me. I traveled through a month through Thailand. I start with the same letter, but they're different. I know. I gotta learn this stuff. I'm geographically illiterate. But I in, in my head, I was kind of craving that experience that I had traveling around Turkey. And just 10 years later, there was internet cafes all over the place. Every little town we went to, there was an internet cafe. And sure, I didn't have to go, but it was so like a siren song. Come back to the familiar, check in with your life, stay connected, say hello, feel those loving notes from people that you miss. And so, I stayed connected. And I think about what it was like in these two months in Turkey when I had not just days to kill, but weeks where I really had no destination, nothing I had to do. And so I sunk into this state of flow that I've never had since. And I wonder if I ever will again. I have been fantasizing about that kind of relinquishing schedule, relinquishing connection, and it would take a massive change to my lifestyle and to a massive amount of discipline to not be connected digitally um, that's just ever present. And I think about what that was like, and I remember sitting and waiting for a bus at times, you know, because we would, Turkey at the time at least, was very much a, a bus-traveled country. And you would, you would, the buses were very nice, and you would have, you know, set, you would have a seat number, and you would have be placed your seat, kind of like a, you know, a plane sort of, but even nicer. The, the, the stewardesses would come down the rows of the bus and give you hot towels to clean your hands and face and bring you tea, and it was very nice. And the nature of a bus in, in a big country with not as many big places is that you often were waiting for these buses. And, I can remember waiting for hours for a bus and just sitting and occasionally reading. But you know, as a traveler, I, I didn't have a Kindle, so I only had a certain number of books until I met another traveler I could trade with. And so often I had no more books to read, and, I, and so I would sit and I would write, or I would sit and sit. If I was waiting for a bus now, it would be seconds before I was on my smartphone. And I don't think I'm alone in this. Go to any public place and see if you can catch anyone's gaze. See how many people are like this, walking around the world, living through a terminal. So one of the things that was interesting about the time that I was in Turkey is that at that time, having a television set was fairly rare. And most of the towns that I visited, there was a, a TV st set in the tea house, like the kind of local gathering place. They don't do a lot of drinking of alcohol, so they gather at the tea house. That's the, the social center. And so the TVs were fairly new, 
programming was fairly limited, but it was really fascinating to be able to watch this unique time in their culture where they now went from generations of kind of isolated experiences with their town. You know, you knew the people that you lived near, you had the job that your father had, you tilled the land, and you just had this kind of pattern. The introduction of television, suddenly you had this window into the world. And not really the world, you had a window into produced television world. Most of what they had was very low budget, um, uh, kind of Turkish, uh, you know, soap opera type things. But that was not what they really wanted to watch. By far, the most popular thing they would watch was Baywatch. So here is this culture of people in a, having a very kind of isolated socialization experience and suddenly they get visited by these angels in red bathing suits and huge breasts. This is a compelling, amazing thing. Maybe they're not angels, maybe they're demons because they taint the world. And very quickly, this world that was kind of you, as a given is what your lot in life was and you, you adapted and adjusted your desires and needs and keeping up with the Joneses actually meant keeping up with someone on your block that was dealing with and working with the same circumstances you were. Suddenly, you are now keeping up with the Hasselhoffs, and everything changes. You are now inadequate. You now don't have enough. You now are in a prime situation for the consumer culture that became so, that now is what we are just living in. Keep in mind, television, by its nature, is a tool for creating desire. I mean that in the television system that we have now, not the technology, but the structure of television is that it is advertising based. I once talked to a, a producer, a television uh, producer, a news guy, and he said, look, I make it very clear to my employees that our job is to fill the space between commercials. Television, because of its motivation, because of how it makes its money, because of the, the way that it, it is structured, its intention is to sell ads. And so even if your core desires are good and you want to share a message of hope and uplifting, you're still, the whole system is, their goal is to make you watch an ad and then make that ad more valuable it's by making you feel like you need either what it has or what other ads have. So the process of television is a process of making you feel like you don't have enough. Very early in television's history, people recognized this is an amazing tool and it's going down this bad path. In fact, Mr. Rogers went in front of Congress to testify about the importance of public broadcasting because he's like, this is changing our world. This is affecting everything. We are surrogate parenting our kids with this tool and it is totally governed by the market it's totally governed by consumerism and it is turning us into this consumer people this ponzi scheme of consumer growth is absolutely fueled by this tool of television now i'm painting a pretty bleak picture i don't mean to imply that there is not good in television or that there isn't good in being exposed to the world. It's not a black and white. I'm just trying to point out the, the dangers that have crept in and become just a part of our reality without us really even thinking about it. So as, let me take a step back. So one of the neat things I did when I was in Turkey uh, because I had so much time. I was with my friend Eric and we just, you know, sometimes we would like find a postcard and be like, what's this, let's try to figure out where this is and go find this castle or these ruins and just go on an adventure. One time we, we actually, we, we got a bus ticket for a place that was like five hours into interior Turkey, some town, not a, not a really a destination, just a place where people lived. And then about halfway on this five hour trip, we just got off in a town. 
just wanted to see, you know, what is a town that is, has nothing to do with tourism? What, what's it like there? And luckily, we'd been in Turkey long enough to know that, that people were exceptionally friendly. It was interesting coming from uh, Greece and Italy and then going to Turkey because in Greece and Italy, if someone approaches you as you get off a bus and says, hello, I will help you, they don't really want to help you. Um, in Turkey, if someone says, hello, I will help you, they mean, hello, I will help you. Pardon my accent, it's been a few years. And so we, you know, got off in these towns and people were like, oh, where are you from? America, oh, America, yes, where? California, oh, surfing, Baywatch, yes? And suddenly we were like, they so wanted to talk to us. They so wanted to practice their English and learn about America because we came from this land that they had recently discovered where the, 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 the streets are paved with gold suntans and cleavage and loose morals and wee. And so when we got off in this little town, we, you know, we met some people and hang out at the tea house because that's what you do. And then we were taken to a local uh, school, like a high school. And they had an English class. And so we visited the English class and we did this kind of uh, question and answer thing. They would ask us, and, you know, they practice, they go, um, where are you from? You know, and we would say, oh, we are from California. Oh, <gasps> California! You know, and then we would struggle and the teacher would help the kids and correct them. And at one point, um, the, the teacher, or no, the, the one student, you know, oh, you're in school, what do you study? And I, and I said, psychology. And, and, and all the kids looked to the, the teacher and the teacher was kind of like nervous. She's like, um, I'm like, um, psychology? And I was like, uh, so I went to the board with chalk and I wrote P, S, Y. And I, she goes, oh, psychology, yes, psychology. And so I was like, Yes, I study psychology. And it was not, it was, it, first of all, that was just adorable. I didn't wanna, I don't know if that was the right or the wrong thing to not correct her. I didn't correct her. I let them think that psychology was the way you pronounce this word. I figured anyone could figure out what they're talking about. But something interesting happened when I was in a conversation not long after with another person that I had, had great English and we were talking for a long time and I was trying to explain to him uh, that I studied psychology. And he's like, well, what is that? And I was like, well, um, are you familiar with Freud? And he's like, no. I'm like, oh, uh, young Freud, uh, Maslow. And he's like, and so I'm like, well, how do you explain psychology? And I was like, well, you know how sometimes, you know, you, you do something or you feel angry about something, but really it's, that's not why you're doing it. Or really that's not why you're angry. You actually have some like motivations beneath the surface that you're actually acting on. And he was like, what? And I ha it was like, oh my gosh, this is a, this is a, a cultural given to me is that is the concepts of psychology, the concepts of the subconscious and all these, these terms and, and, and belief systems and worldviews that I just take for granted. And here this person was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Why on earth would I do something when that's not the real reason why I'm doing it? And I realized that that's what I started studying, that psychology of why we do things and how we think. And, and really that's been the study that I have embraced ever since as a personal path and more recently as kind of what we talk about here and what we kind of make as a spiritual practice of figuring out, okay, I'm acting from these patterns. I have this socialization that has been layered upon me, whether through Baywatch or my parents or whatever. And where in this spectrum of actions and desires and values, where am I? How much of this is onion skin layers and is there anything as you strip it all away? I've come to believe with everything I have that yes, there is a core to what we are and who we are and what we believe and what we feel as our inherent values of love and compassion and connection. 
But there's so much more that is just a product of the socialization process. And as I've been thinking lately about this, and think going back and thinking about our Turkish friends and their transition from going from the socialization process of your family to the socialization process of this external television media, and thinking about how powerful that is on our lives and what we are and what we do, and thinking about how many people around the world are beginning to interact with their worlds through the socializing media of their terminal. And I'm wondering how much of our experiences of the world are actually experiences in the world and how much of it are degrees separated experiences of the world. When you're watching a television show about an adventure, you're not having an adventure. Now your brain might actually release chemicals that make you feel, oh, 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 but that's not the same thing. You can play a video game and your brain will flood you with fear, and, uh, 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 but it's not the same thing. Television has this insulating ability to give us recreations, stimulate, st simulations of world experiences, but it's not the same thing. There's a great uh, part of the, the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance where he clarifies that an art print is not the same thing as art. If you have a print of a Picasso in your house, what you have is a photograph of art. Art is something that is created. It has inherent in it the energy, the brush strokes, the history of its creation. You can appreciate the art of a photograph of art, but it is not the same thing. It doesn't have the same feel. And that is a very subtle understanding, and it is one I think that applies also to television and experiencing the world through the computer. Terminal-based living, which is becoming the default. Yes, it, you can appreciate things this way. Yes, you can have emotions. You can even have physical sensations. I mean, pornography. By Everything about pornography is the process of giving you a, a multiple, multiple levels removed experience of sexuality. And it becomes a replacement for many people. It becomes a, because it has a way of, of tapping into the brain chemicals and triggering these things, it can be a very powerful experience of a photograph of the world. And I wonder, as we were studying and thinking about last week about Joseph Campbell and about the man with a thousand faces and about the idea of the hero's journey as being possibly the purpose of why we're here. That doesn't mean the hero's journey means that you slay a dragon, literally, or that you have to conquer a mountain, literally. But it does mean that we all have to come to terms with our upbringing, our who we thought we were, challenges in our lives, overcoming those things and finding out who we are. And I wonder if the process of terminal-based living gives us that same opportunities. I wonder if we are still, as a culture, living life, this gift, or are we slipping into a place of observing life? Can you battle a digital dragon? Absolutely. But as someone who has spent a long time and being very passionate about the power of the, the love potential of the web, I'm really starting to slip into a place of, whoa, this is a tool that needs to be balanced. You know, opium is a great discovery for pain killing. It's not something that you stay on all the time. Terminal based interactions are great tools for discovery, for connecting in certain ways. It is not something that we need to stay on all the time. I'm saying this not as a accusation, I'm saying this as a message to myself. <sighs> Having bus stops and hours to just be is kind of a endangered species if it's not extinct. 
the world is filled with stimulus cranked up to stimulate your brain as much as possible. It's a Big Mac with the salt cranked up. It's visuals cranked up. It's porn cranked up. Coom, 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 coom. It reminds me of the people in Naked Lunch. There was a, a, a certain type of addict that had holes drilled in their head and they would take electrical wires and they would just stimulate their pleasure centers in the alley, oblivious to the world. No longer actually having experiences that would give them joy, they just gave themselves joy. Maybe joy is the strong word, pleasure is probably more accurate. But I, I worry that this path that I have been leading the charge on is one of stimulating our brain and bypassing the experiences, the connections that can give us the pleasure and the joy. Clearly it's not black and white, clearly it is a balance, clearly it's an amazing tool that can, in the same way that it can convince us that we should be wed to uh, Heather Locklear and, and our wife is not enough, it also can show us perspectives and beliefs and worldviews that absolutely open our mind and our spirit in, in unbelievable ways. I mean, I can remember, not, you know, not to close on too negative, I can remember before the internet how hard it was to find information about alternative thinking. You had to go to a, a cult bookstore or weird online, um, or not online, weird like paper catalogs to order books about Eastern philosophy. I mean, this was, you had to really go out of your way. Now you hear, what? What's the name of that person? Well, let me go online and listen to this master speak and hear and feel and suddenly go, wow, the world I knew is not all there is. So somewhere in the using a tool and it becoming our life is the balance that I am seeking. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, the support as we walk this path together. That being said, I also want to weather all this negativity with the awareness that this Tuesday gathering, this archived and live experience of putting a vibration into the world, knowing that others are vibrating at the same frequency and having that just very real awareness of something more real, true, amazing, perfect, loving, connected, than anything that is being given through a terminal and yet it is facilitated by the terminal so I am grateful while I am wary so I'm grateful for this experience and, and the real you that is a part of it so thank you let's have a hug nation hug and fuse the terminal and the spiritual and the physical and the theoretical and the intentional so wherever you are Oh, grab yourself by the shoulders. Mm. And we recognize these digital tools can create time tunnels, space tunnels. But as my voice is hitting your ear, it could be live from a whole other country, hundreds of miles away. It could be in the future that my voice is reaching the other end of this tunnel and you hear in your ears and that experience is miraculous that experience makes the world more connected with an amazing potential for unity and for compassion and for love but let's recognize that this tool is one that we need to keep the reins of and not allow it to simply become our our terminal to the world and recognize that there is much to experience in the world firsthand not just art but life not photos of life not photos of art but very real experiences of the now and if we can balance the tools and the now and the experience then we can be on a path that is governed not by any socialization not by any external force trying to get us to consume, but by an internal magnet, internal pulling towards harmony, towards love, 
towards our purpose of compassion and oneness. So let's just take a breath and just feel that pull towards our truth. Take a deep breath. On behalf of Grandpa Caleb and all the love warriors, happy hug nation. Thank you for enjoying this playground, playing with the tools and toys, and also tuning inward and recognizing your truth and your gifts that you share through terminals as well as through the world. You are the magic. You are the one. We are it. Namaste. You only live once. Enjoy the color.